Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host, and I want to introduce you to my next guest. This guest has been a petitioner here in the Redress of Grievance Committee, and he's petitioner number 34, and the name that goes with that is Dan Shepard. Dan Shepard. Dan, thank you for coming on the show. I know you didn't have to, and uh, I appreciate you doing it. So uh, you know, each petition has a... Uh, has its own qualities, and uh, yours has a, a different ring to it that uh, has to do with uh, how you were treated in court, the findings, and one of the things that uh, we're doing now is we're bringing on petitioners who've been founded. You've gone through the Redress of Grievance Committee, and you've gone through how many hearings, by, how many times were you before us? Um, three, four? I think three times I came in. Okay. And um, some were committee meetings, I believe. Right. And, and you had to testify. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about the process that you, you felt? I, I recall the first time I met you, we were in the hall, and you were already, you were worked up because one of the, the, the members of the committee was attacking you before they even heard you. Yes. And I, I want to start right there. What was that all about? because uh, I, I saw that individual walking by us, yeah. listening to our conversation. Yeah, he went back and forth a couple times. So um, what, what was that all about? Well, uh, I'm not sure if I can say names sure. and stuff. Uh, I, that, well, I th this think is you're referring up. to uh, yes, Tim Horrigan. And he has a web blog. Um, and he was blogging about my petition, which I thought was kind of strange, because he was also sitting on the committee. So he was sort of being the judge and also being the press at the same time, it now, seemed to this me. is before the committee even heard anything. Yes. yes, I had, originally I was petition 29, and I had, you know, through Patrick Abrami, he submitted it. Uh, I had written it up for him, he submitted it. Um, I guess there was an error when he sort of translated from what I had given him to what actually goes in officially, right. and my former spouse's name was mentioned. Okay. Which I guess there's some rule that there's yeah. some. You got to protect the innocent. Yeah, for uh, sure. That makes, that makes perfect sense to me. Right. And I guess wh whoever with a pair of eyes that are supposed to screen these things as they make it through the chain right. uh, somehow missed that. So it got and, all the way through with her name on it. And that's kind of an important point, too, if, I, if you don't mind me digressing a little bit. There's a chain, there's a chain of events. I mean, you're not just a disgruntled person that just had. You, you want to appear before the House of Redress, you had to go through a process. You had to get a, a sponsor. Mm -hmm. It had to go before the Rules Committee. Mm -hmm. It had to go then before our committee at, right. at that point. Uh, so there's, there's a whole screening process before it even gets to that point. But I guess I was a little upset when I found out, I mean, you're in the hall, I'm looking at you, you're talking to me, say, who's, this, who's this Tim Horgan guy? He's attacking me. He hasn't even heard my case yet. Well, he contacted my ex-wife. Okay. And... I guess based only on talking to one side, even mm. though he had complete access to me, if he had wanted to speak to me about anything, he could have. Um, but he started blogging, it seemed to me, based strictly on what she was telling him. Right. Um, and as you can see, I have my trusty computer. I have right. uh, dozens and dozens of documents. I can back up pretty much everything I say, and in the most cases, uh, I can back it up with the words of the people who were disputing it. When you came before the committee, though, you thought you were going to listen to a bunch of open minds, but you already yeah. had somebody working and against it you. And it was very clear that he was already forming 
his opinion right. um, before even really hearing my side of it. Now, you've gone through the process. You've gone through the hearings. Uh, there have been at least two, three hours uh, per hearing. Uh, mm -hmm. What type of evidence did you have to bring before in order for your case to be founded? Uh, I brought a number of actual motions. I have collected all of the audio transcripts from, I think the first one was in early 2006. That was actually a written transcript. All the way through, uh, I've gotten them all. And we just had mm -hmm. another hearing early this year, um, so 2012. Right. You know, six or seven years of being in the system. I collected all those. I transcribed most of them myself, just because it's expensive to do otherwise. But I cross-referenced every statement to the, there's a timestamp, so you can go directly to right. the actual audio, and I made those available as well. You put a lot of work into it. I put a lot of work. In fact, it was so complicated, I had to write a summary and then build a web page such that you could click on anything in the summary and it would actually bring up the document so you could see for yourself exactly what was written with an image of the true document. You didn't have to take my word for anything. So basically, when you made a statement, mm -hmm. the courts did this. Correct. This was the order. This is the law or this is the violation of mm -hmm. what they're, they're supposed to do. Right. And here's my evidence. And that's really the evidence. You made a claim, and you backed it up. Yes. So whether another side heard that or not, here's the actual documentation. Exactly. And that's what the committee accepts. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get lost in, well, they, they, they get into the storytelling. And that's not, that's not how you're going to win your case. Right. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I want to congratulate you on that, the, the fact you. that you did. And the fact that you don't have to be here right now, just before we were on camera, you said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much in a good spot. Yes. It, I, I, I'm here, and I'm continuing to pursue this, um, uh, a couple things in parallel, because I just think it's really important. One thing I've sort of learned in going through this whole process of divorce in New Hampshire is that a lot of the people that you come up against or you come in contact with, as soon as they hear it relates to a divorce matter, you can just, you can see it in their face. It's like, oh yeah, here's another angry divorce litigant, uh, right. and, and they don't listen. They just tune out. And I've, in my matter, I've had a number of things which I think are out. In fact, I've had FBI agents look at documents, um, and they've essentially Upon reading a paragraph, they immediately flipped to the back, saw that it was notarized, signed under oath, and he said, this is essentially a confession of a federal crime. And I said, well, will it be prosecuted? And he said, you know, years ago it would, but these days so many of our resources are devoted to homeland security that if these things don't come to uh, a value of at least around $100,000, I got to be honest, they'll never make it to the top of the pile. And that was the kind of thing I was up against. I presented this stuff to the judge, and he would change his uh, decisions, but would never really come to any decision other than it's worth zero. So it's like... Falling through the cracks. Everything falls through the cracks. Um, and. I mean, I know that the particular marital master in my case, which is uh, Phil Cross, I know he's been up on a lot of things. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit torn on some of the things. I think on the one hand, there are a lot of things that I feel he just plain got wrong and that there was no real excuse for him getting it wrong. But there were a number of things where uh, the other side had just thrown so much in front of him without any real evidence to support it. But it gets to the point where it just becomes so overwhelming that you can't sift through it. That's why I had to actually build a website to organize this stuff. So they beat you down through attrition, basically. Well, That's... they beat you down through attrition. They beat the judge down to the point where he has no idea. It's just such a mess that I think what he tries to do is, I'm just going to cut it down the middle. And so for something where... It shouldn't have been, it should have been cut all the way at the edge. He's so confused that he's just like, ah, we'll split the baby. 
What's the solution? Well, I think a big part of it has got to be um, you've got to have real evidence, not just these offers of proof. And I understand that in some of these situations, it's hard to collect the evidence. One person might not be in the marital home anymore. They may feel they don't have access to it. Um, in my case, uh, anything that I was asked for, I tried to provide and provide quickly. Uh, but there were other things when I tried to ask for them, I never got them. In fact, I even had to file a motion in limine at one point because I could not get... Motion in limine? A motion in limine is where you uh, essentially say, I've tried to do discovery. They have not provided the documents that I've requested legally and properly through all the things you're supposed to file to ask for them. And because they haven't given me this that I legitimately asked for, they should be barred from you being able to use that right. in their own defense because why should they get to use it if they won't provide it to me such that I can make you know, a fair argument to the other side. Um, stuff still came in. I can't explain it. It wasn't right. I did ultimately try to appeal to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has the option of saying, ah, eh, we don't want to be bothered. Rule and 3 that, And that's what they did. They declined to take, they didn't, it wasn't found against me. They just didn't, didn't look it. at it. Right. And it's because these things are a mess. And the, I suspect they're kind of overwhelmed. Um, so they said, this one's going to take too much of our time, is what I'm thinking, is their logic. Right. Because I, I think that my arguments were extremely sound. So you're, you're running up against a brick wall. You're finding that the courts are basically dropping the ball. Uh, in some cases. And, and to be fair to this marital master, I think there were some things where he really wanted to get it right. Okay. And No malice on uh, intent. No. Uh, okay, no. Right. Well, there were other times where I think he just lost his temper. I think things were so confusing and so overwhelming that it, my read of him was that he got angry at points. And... For example, there was one instance where my ex's lawyer filed a motion mm -hmm. uh, and in the motion said that I had already agreed to it. It was a motion to continue uh, a hearing date. Right. Now, I wanted to do some additional discovery. So normally when you have these types of uh, assented to motions, you have to sort of work out all your terms and what you're going to agree to. Right. And then you sub yeah, yeah, it's like a contract, exactly. So if the thing goes in as an assented to motion, and then you want to change it after the fact, or one side does and the other side says, no, I don't want to change it, the court's going to look at the person saying they want to change it and say, what's the matter with you? You've already had your chance to negotiate it. Right. You agreed to it. You submitted it. Except for one small problem. They never contacted me. <laughs> it was completely <laughs> false. It's not funny, but it's... it's it's not funny. I'm sorry. And I don't mean to be, it, it, it just seems to be the ongoing issue where it, the left hand doesn't seem to know what the right, right hand's doing and y somebody's going to pay the price for that. Right. And, and it, it's not justice. Well, and I was pro se at the time. So here I'm going into court as a pro se litigant. And here is your esteemed member of the legal community, another lawyer, attorney Kerry Marshall, who has filed an assented to motion basically saying, hey, he already agreed to this. And I'm in court and I'm saying, I never agreed to this. It makes me look like an idiot. In fact, she has testified and she's been on the stand for an attorney discipline matter. And she even said that it probably put me in a bad light to have been put in that situation. Now, granted, she's also stipulated to the fact that I was never contacted. So the assented to motion, she filed it. She's acknowledged that this probably made me look bad with the court. Meanwhile, I want to do some discovery. Right. You know, and this is all working against me, and I'm doing everything right. Now, a couple of years later, it comes out that she says, yeah, yeah, no one in my office really ever contacted you. And it was not easy to get that out of her. Um, this order, this uh, hearing notice came from the court, I think it was on a July 23rd. And they sent it back in on July 24th. So I knew that it had to have been either July 23rd or July 24th that they would have had to have contacted me. Right. And it was my deep-rooted belief that their argument was going to be, 
No one has itemized bills for landlines anymore. How can we prove it one way or another? And frankly, that would have flown beautifully, except for one small thing. That has happened to be the two days that my new bride at the time um, happened to be having a double eye cornea transplant surgery at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston. We were there at the crack of dawn right. the first day. Oops. And because of complications, she was held overnight. I had to go out and get my cell phone data, and I even had to get the cell tower locator data. So you can see where I was at the crack of dawn on my cell phone, moving right. from tower to tower in Boston all day with my, with my bride, home late at night to take care of the animals, back down early the next day. So I knew I had the evidence. You had to go through this entire process, though, to prove that. Yes. And, and that's... That's incredible. Now, were you pro se because uh, that's it's too expensive? It's just very expensive. Now, did you file a, P a PCC complaint? A yes, I did. And was it accepted? It was accepted. It is still ongoing. Now, um, in order to file one of those, you have to have clear and convincing evidence. Yes. And so that they can find clear and convincing evidence. Yeah. Uh, we've gone through this with, with the Ginsburg case, and uh, that was a very complicated one, but uh, I don't believe he got his justice either, uh, based upon the evidence that you have to provide. But the fact that when you provide something, it, it has to say, well, you know, geez, there's something here. We'll let it go to this level. Yeah. And now you say it's still ongoing. Yes. Um, we've gone in the uh, prosecutor, uh, from the attorney discipline office picked one of the matters, which was this assented to motion. And part of it was, since I was so convinced that they would try and rely on this, we don't have an itemized phone bill, so how can we prove it argument? And in fact, that was mentioned. The East Kingston police got involved, um, and this attorney s mentioned that to them about the no itemized bill in one of her written responses to the uh, attorney discipline office, it was mentioned in there. So I knew this was, would have been a tough one to, to prove, right. except for this double eye cornea transplant Which, surgery. And I'm thinking to myself, how many people have been in this situation? And I went and looked up prior complaints. Right. And a number of them seem to have failed because in the end, the committee said, we just can't find by clear and convincing evidence that there was wrongdoing. Now, I looked at that and said, it doesn't seem to me they're saying there wasn't wrongdoing. They were, seemed to be saying that they can't prove there was wrongdoing. Right. But and when here, you see smoke, I had solid, right. solid proof. And I said, if I don't do this, Some thing I keep doing. this is going to keep happening. And the harm that's been done to my two children throughout this whole process mm. made me dig in my heels and say, no, someone's going to have to fight this fight, yeah. and I'm going to take a shot at being that person. Now, when, when uh, you say that you looked up these other cases, there was smoke, but obviously they, they know enough that mm -hmm. the amount of, of difficulty, the right. level of difficulty, I should say, is, is so hard to prove mm -hmm. you're innocent or you're not guilty or uh, on that level, it, it, it's, yeah. uh, they took the gamble. Right. And this, this gamble they lost. Well, and I tried to double down on this mm -hmm. um, because as soon as the response started coming back, like, hey, first it was, he assented. I don't know what he's talking about. I started in all my responses, I put it, I said, well, if she's that convinced, why doesn't she have an affidavit saying from the person that supposedly contacted me, have that person sign an affidavit saying, yes, I contacted them, blah, 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 because I knew they couldn't get it. And I figured this person would refuse to provide it. And it, it got to the point where I even typed up a sample affidavit with blanks in it and said, just to make it easy so there's no excuse, here you go. But you're not going to sign it because it's a lie. It's funny because some They signed it. They did, yeah. That's, so now it's perjury, false swearing, witness tampering, whatever. And that was in the findings that we... No, no, that's part of what's still ongoing, the person who supposedly contacted me, but they subsequently stipulated that mm -hmm. I was never contacted, and this person even said, look, the attorney came to me, um, 
showed me what to do. I typed it up, signed it, and but gave the, it back. The, the attorney was mentioned in, in the findings from what... Oh, yeah. Right. That, that, that's what I wanted to make clear. Uh, I just find that interesting. There were a number of times where, in the Johnson case, we were talking about uh, affidavits that he had provided affidavit after affidavit. And the opposite uh, side of the, the aisle, the Democratic side, they said, well, geez, affidavits, come on. What are those? We see them all the time. They don't mean anything. And, that's, and I'm scratching that's the my tragedy. head. Well, what is going on here? Why are they sabotaging this opportunity for you to petition your mm -hmm. government? It's part of your First Amendment rights. Yeah. As well as Article 31 and 32 of our Constitution, of the New Hampshire Constitution, mm -hmm. that you have a right to petition your government. Yeah. So you, you petition your government with, with more than just hearsay. You've got the oh, evidence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's my affidavits. Here's my documents. What's the problem? Where are you going with this now? Um, the, You've been founded. You're still doing stuff. Still pursuing things. Uh, the matter with the attorney is ongoing. Um, the uh, prosecutor in the attorney discipline matter uh, from the attorney discipline office recommended a six-month suspension of the license. The hearing committee um, came back and said that uh, they recommend a um, uh, public censure, which to me doesn't, right. it doesn't seem to mean anything to me. Basically, um, uh, that's one of the things that we discovered also is that when somebody's being disciplined. Well, they're disciplining one of their own, for one. Right. And it, 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 in my opinion, my humble opinion, it doesn't seem as though it's, uh, it, what time's your tea time? Yeah. Huh. It, it, it's not going to be 10 o'clock. It'll be 12. Right. It, it, I mean, I'm, I'm being very facetious, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem as though uh, it's a big deal. Well, and you've got an attorney on one hand who asked this office worker with a high school education, that's it, um, to sign this affidavit saying that she contacted me. And if you look at the first affidavit, and there mm. were two of them, and I'll get to that. If you look at the first affidavit, you put it side by side with the form that I provided for them, the paragraphs of the affidavit are virtually identical. In fact, on the first affidavit, one of the blanks they missed, and they even left, they just left it out. Um, so the first affidavit came back with a date that was about three weeks before the notice of hearing from the court. So obviously, that date's wrong. Right. So they had to go back again, and as came out from the testimony, uh, this office worker was like, well, I just trusted you, uh, Ms. <laughs> attorney, that you were giving me the right date. Um, oh I guess the attorney must have just taken my form. Now, she says she showed it to the office worker just so she'd know what format. But if you look at it, it's like she must have had it in her possession as she typed it up because it is letter for letter identical pretty much for the paragraphs right. in the body of it. I mean, the header, boilerplate type stuff, top and bottom. But there was, you know, a, a paragraph in there which talked about the detail of the communication, which was in my sample, but which was left out. And I want to know, what was the conversation between the office worker and the attorney when she said, well, what do I do with this? Right. I mean, did the attorney just say, leave it out? Did the clerical worker say, well, I don't know any of these details. I'll just on my own decide to leave it out, which would not be consistent with what I thought she was saying in the rest of her testimony. It didn't seem that she would make that kind of a decision on her own. Right. Um, so, you know, this, these two affidavits came down to, did the attorney cause the office worker to sign two false affidavits? And in fact, in the end, the committee said, yeah, because mm -hmm. of the attorney, um, this office worker did do that. Now, in my mind, that's, uh, witness tampering. There's an RSA which says if you cause someone to testify falsely, you've committed a felony. Right. Now the committee, for some reason, I guess doesn't seem to see it that way. And I guess since there's been no other finding, to be fair, it's not been found to be that way. Because I guess they're saying that the attorney didn't really realize what the facts are when she asked this person to sign the affidavit. But in my mind, isn't that the same thing? Right. If the attorney has access to the data but chooses not to look at it, but still goes to 
this you know, low-level person in the office says, I need an affidavit. This person's going to provide it. This is their job. Do you feel the committee served you justice? Uh, yeah, I think the committee did. Now, there were three people who objected, um, Tim Horrigan being one of them, and uh, Keynes, I think Sandra it was. Keynes. Sandra Keynes. And she wrote a, a minority report, um, and I've read that. And did it make sense to you? Well, it's sort of the basic of what you think should happen. You get a day in court, you present your evidence. If your evidence is sound, you get a good verdict. If it doesn't prove things, you get a bad verdict. And they said, so therefore, this grievance should be unfounded. But the point is... Totally dismissing everything else that yeah, you've just gone through. <laughs> exactly. It's, it completely ignores the fact that the judge made blatant mistakes. And I provided all the evidence. In fact, Tim Horgan on his blog was talking about the CD that he took a copy of. So he can't say he didn't have the evidence. He had extensive evidence. I brought, and I handed out a copy of the CD to everyone in that hearing room. Right. So in fact, Tim Horgan took two copies. So they had the evidence. And yet in their uh, minority report, they're saying he didn't present any evidence. Like, there was a lot of evidence. There was a whole CD. Uh, I could evidence. testify that there was. Yes. So here you, you bring the evidence, uh, and you try to appeal to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. based upon these egregious, yep. and they don't hear you. And they just decline to hear the case. Now, so they, where do you go from there? I come to you guys. Right. You know, and, and I understand there's mm -hmm. uh, one of the grievances that's out there, and it's been in the press with the Attorney General and DCYF or stuff yep. like that. And, you know, I can see why people want to protect the institutions because they do serve some purpose. But if you're thinking of coming up with a given law or rule or what have you and say this one size is going to fit all, isn't that right? You're, you're, you're fooling yourself. Humans are imperfect, they make mistakes. And when these things happen, there's got to be a mechanism to address it. And that's exactly. what I see this redress of grievance, and right. it's why I came forward with mine. And, and, and the House needs to hear this stuff, and, and, and the fact that it is based upon evidence. Yes. The problem I'm seeing over and over and over again is this lack of accountability uh, uh, throughout our government, whether it's DCYF, whether it's the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Who's the Attorney General accountable to? Yeah. These people, they should be accountable to the people. Mm -hmm. They're serving the people. But what it seems to me, they, they can just totally ruin a life. Yeah. And whether intentionally or non-intentionally, you know, not everything is, is out of malice. But this, this big stampede just coming right at you, how do you stop City Hall? Yeah. You have a right to speak up and be heard. That's what we're doing here. But... Once the evidence is proved before a panel, I mean, this is kind of grueling. I, I know with the Youssef case, there, was, there were nine hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Haas case, just as many. There, there were a number of hearings, and we grilled them. I mean, well, show me the evidence. And papers go around. There it is. There it yeah. is. There it is. Well, why aren't they looking at this? we got to start holding the people accountable. And part of the, the solution, in my opinion, is that we obviously have to have legislation. Mm -hmm but we have to do it right. Right. Uh, CACR 26 is one of the pieces of uh, legislation that's coming up that's going to be on the ballot. And I'm asking the people of New Hampshire, they've got to vote yes. Mm -hmm. It holds the courts that much more accountable. But it's only that much more. Yep. But Rule 3.9, which uh, basically ruins your right to appeal to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. you should have automatic appeal. And for a final divorce decree, you do. Though at the time, I, I mean, I didn't really know too much of this. I had been pro se briefly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, at, at the outset of all this, uh, uh, the court awarded me sole possession of the marital home and custody of both children. Right. Um, and, and you're still going through all this grief. Yeah, and mm -hmm. still going through all of this grief. And it became very contentious. And... Um, you know, and I think part of it is divorce, my read of it, I mean, it's just my personal opinion based on what I've observed going through the last seven years or so, is it's quite a big business. 
Mm -hmm. um, a lot of money. There's a lot of money at stake. And frankly, even if you're an honest attorney and doing everything by the book, I mean, my attorneys at the very beginning even went so far as to say, look, if at any point you have second thoughts, you think you'd like to try and give a shot at keeping things together, say the word, we'll put a hold on everything. Right. I, you know, I, I thought they were really very decent people, mm -hmm. um, but they were very expensive. So this firm, and, and there were two lawyers, depending on who was available. So you know, within no time, I had spent probably $50,000. And that's being pro se, or is that, that's that with was, the lawyer? That that's was with the lawyers. With the lawyers, right. And I was, uh, in no time, I mean, I had the house and the children, um, but no money, really. Right. So at that point, I, I had to go pro se. And th this is when things started really getting nasty. And uh, How are the children doing? Uh, they're having a rough time with it. I mean, it, it has been a very, very hard on them. I don't think that their lives will ever be at the same place that they might have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the biggest heartache of the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. At the outset of this thing, you know, I was, you go to that, whatever that seminar is on how to deal with kids and all. And I took it very, very seriously. And when I realized the kids were being told all kinds of absurd things about me. Right. Um, I mean, I was able to uh, document that um, my former spouse was telling the children I was a homosexual. Um, you know, <laughs> this is not the kind of thing a 15-year-old high school that's boy they, wants to hear right. or can hear and then continue to do well in school. But they're not supposed to be doing it, and that's what those, those classes are, right. not to get the kids involved. In, in, exactly. And for the record, you're not here as a mad dad because you have the kids. No, no. Ultimately, when I went pro se, mm -hmm. I lost custody of the kids. Right. Um, but but at, the, at this point, what I'm saying is you, you're not a mad dad. This, this no. has to do with the whole process. It has to do with the whole process. Right. I mean, uh, the problem that I had for dealing with the kids is I knew these things were being done and said to these children, um, but I did not want to do anything that drew them into the problem. Right. If I were to start fighting back on these things as I was hearing they them, then the X would then escalate. And now the kids would be in the middle of both sides warring mm -hmm. at an escalating rate and then they would really be toast. So I made the decision early on, and I still question whether it was the right decision to just sort of step back from it, let her say whatever she wanted to say, and everyone was saying, the kids will figure it out. Kids are not stupid. They will eventually figure all of it out. But, you know, I mean, to be accused of all kinds of abuse and all, um, one day, someone gave me a copy of an email that the, uh, my ex had written in which she was writing to someone it was about her boyfriend saying he beat her up. And she says, I've never been hit in my life. I don't know what to do. Well, I... And the kids are involved with this? Well, no. To some degree. Oh, well, they, they're the kids, I mean, even before I knew about the affairs and stuff, um, I, I learned that my ex had taken my daughter, for example, to a birthday party for this, this guy. Um, so, I mean, the kids were being sort of they got to know this, something to, is going to on. this whole thing. Yeah, right. they, and they did. And I think that the, all of these things that she was saying about me was so that they would say, well, I can see why she's doing it. This makes it acceptable. Um, but How do you fight that? Well, ultimately, I, I showed my daughter this one email. Yeah. And her immediate reaction was she got really angry. And this is always hard to talk about for me. Um, she got really angry and said, how could you have not said anything? So, as though I had let her down right. by not drawing her in, by making these kids a part of this whole thing. And it's, so I just said, can't because, win. yeah, you can't win. Uh. So I said, because this is what the experts said to do. And it wasn't easy. Mm. Didn't take much time at all. She came around. Yeah. That's and where she figured it out. That's where she, yeah. right there, it's like, 
I get it now. Yeah. This is why dad's so quiet. And this is why nothing that I'm being told seems to make sense. What do you want our listeners and viewers to take away from this conversation that we had? File, don't quit, give up, don't give up, what? Well, you know, I, I've heard from different people with different outcomes. There's some people whose kids never speak to them again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, it's some of these online chats, and I've tried to give some of them encouragement saying, hang in there. Yeah. You know, it will happen. I mean, ultimately, my daughter wrote her college essay on, uh, she at that point was thinking that she might be interested in majoring in psychology and thought that by bringing her experience with this whole awful thing mm. to the classroom, she could share it with other kids and it would be a learning experience for all of them. Um, so, you know, there are going to be some who don't come around for a very long time. Right. I, was, I was very lucky, but I was always very close with my kids. Yeah. Um, so you were, you were honest too. Yes, yes, very honest. And you know, when things don't make sense to kids, they will question it. Um, so once the truth starts appearing, it forms up pretty quickly in their mind, yeah. and th and they come around pretty quickly. Now there's still some anger. There's still issues they're dealing with, um, right. but you know they know I'm there for them. Yeah. I mean, I've tried to always make that very clear to them. How much time did you have with them through this, this whole process, uh, with the, for, starting from the beginning to, to, to the end? I mean, in the beginning, you, you had the kids? I had the kids, um, and then the custody switched. Right. Um, Why did the custody switch? Uh, well, partly the GAL got involved. Um, there was an incident at the school mm -hmm. where we had worked out a change in the parenting time. I went to pick up my daughter at the school, and my ex showed up at the school and got, was on the cell phone and was getting my daughter all worked up. So I came to pick up my daughter, and she's like, no, I'm supposed to go with mom. And some teacher walked by <coughs> and just walks into the office, makes an absurd assumption saying, there's some guy and a child out there. And, he says she's supposed to go, and she says she doesn't want to go with him. It looks like a child abduction, you know. Well, it's a serious thing, but it, it, this was clearly my night to have my daughter, you know, right. for visiting time. And the guardian ad litem wrote a letter to the school. He never discussed this particular thing with me they, and to the court saying, we need to figure something out here. And things guardian just... Guardian ad says one thing, and that's it. Oh. And Did they have more rights than the parents? Well, and he was seeing things very much on my side for a long time. Yeah. But That's a um, lot of power, though. That's a lot of power. Well, never ask a guardian ad litem if they use illegal drugs on the witness stand because they can turn on you real fast. But at that time, my only concern was the well-being of my kids. So yeah. I asked that question. Not smart. Probably well, should have never asked it. Were you suspecting that they were? He was? Or, um, or were you just being ticked off? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I had specific conversations with the guardian about what he had told my son about using drugs. And I said, didn't you just tell him, don't use them? And so it made me suspicious that maybe this guy was a little too soft for my liking when right. it comes to drug use. So I asked him the question. It and he said, I don't have to answer that. Right. And then that's when everything things, starts things going Things seem to start changing from then on. But that's the point. I, the guardian at Lightums, their personalities change, then so does your, your, your parent, yeah. par parenting plan. And that's got to change right. or get rid of the whole system. Right. Because they're not representing the children. When the children mm -hmm. are taken away from a good parent, mm -hmm. they're being harmed. Yeah. Uh, and my ex would go away for a weekend and just leave the kids, 14, 15-year-old in the house. Right. That's I mean, the neighbor told me after 10 months she had to move with her two very young children because it was so noisy at night. There were times I got called, police came and arrested a dozen kids in the house. There was drugs and alcohol everywhere and no parent to be found. And, and it's like... Nobody notifies you. Well, they, they notify me when they're over there in the police station and someone has to go get them. But not when they're alone. Right. Talk a, a, real quickly about 
the process of, of the redress of grievance again, just a little bit as we recap, because uh, the people need to understand that they can petition their government. Yes. What do you advise them? How do you advise them to approach this process? Well, first you've got to find one of your, you know, a state rep. I found Patrick Abrami and uh, explained what had happened. And this is where you want to really have thought this out in advance, have all the documents. Uh, my approach and approach I would recommend to anyone is not expect anyone to take anything that you say at face value. You want to back up every single sentence with some right. kind of documentation. So that was my approach. And if you're in the right and you take this approach, people will see very quickly that the system failed. I have some emails that um, I won't tell their names. Mm -hmm. But some, one lady, she wants to come on the show. Oh, but I'm, I'm afraid that the guardian light is going to take my kid away. I'm afraid that the courts are going to take my kid away if I tell the truth, if I get on, on, online and I start talking. I, I'm trying to convince her, listen, speak up. If you're telling the truth, they don't have a right to break the law. We have to bring these cases, and, and there's a number of them. But these people are afraid to come out. It'll hurt my case if I, if I go out in public and tell the truth. No. Yeah. You have to come forward, and I appreciate what you, you, you've been doing. But that, this has a value to you. Mm -hmm. It gets your case out. It shows the wrongdoings that are going, whether it's a judge, whether it's the lawyer, whether it's the guardian at litem, or the system. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the process. Do you recommend people to do this? Um, if they've got a strong case, yeah. yeah. If it's a close call, it, it probably isn't going to work. It's probably, right. you're going to probably end up with the same result you had in court. Right. In my case, I mean, I had documents where things were sworn that were not true. And I mean, by the lawyer, by my ex, um, where law enforcement had looked at things in some cases. I mean, there was a, a piece of property that um, one day, as the whole divorce thing just started to hit, you know, within a week or two of getting this I notice this in the mail. Right. Um, my ex is saying that there was this piece of property that we had been trying to acquire, and she said the guy, you know, just disappeared. It's a total loss. And then she said, oh, no, no, that's still happening. And then she said, no, no, it's a total loss. And I was saying, what's going on here? I mean, yeah. we're, we're just getting into a divorce. I remember this. And all this stuff is, is starting to hit. And it's like, all right, I had a little corporate shell that we were doing this with, so I said, fine. Let me at least make sure I'm clearly in the loop. So I filed a page of corporate resolution saying, you know, if you're going to transfer assets and do any of these types of uh, transactions that have a, a sort of a corporate kind of an aspect to them, um, that the board of directors, which by the corporate charter was me, mm -hmm. uh, had to be involved. Right. And my ex complained, said, well, how can I run the business? I said, fair enough. So the, I immediately, within less than a day, although maybe it was the next morning, I filed one more resolution which said, for the normal day-to-day -day operations of the business, obviously, you don't need any approval from the board. Um, she then filed, initially she had filed for uh, a legal separation. She amended it to a petition for divorce saying that I'm destroying her business and she can't conduct business, and she attached the first page of resolutions. The second page was nowhere to be found. Right. You know, so there was that kind of that's stuff going on. It's the type on. of fraud going on, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, um, so the, these are all the details that you have to bring out. You right. have to prove. You have to. Yeah, and out. I, I mean, and just trying to explain one, I get from one thing off to the other. I mean, yeah. that property went into bankruptcy. It turned out the individual she was trying to do the deal with, he came, I got him to come in and testify. And he said, she came to me couple years ago, a year or so ago, and said, I want to keep this off the radar right. until the divorce is final. Otherwise, we'll have to share this property. So if you can finish the transaction, do it after the divorce is final. If you can't, reimburse the money after the divorce is final. And this went on for a year. Now, meanwhile, she's filing financial affidavits, making no mention of that property. Right. In her answers to interrogatories, she said, the property owner stole my down payment and took off. Well, it turned out he was still living in exactly the same place he had lived for a decade it's or fraud. more. 
It's outright fraud. Right. And a year into this, he goes bankrupt. So he files for bankruptcy. And he testified that the two of them discussed it, and they agreed they would not list her debt on the bankruptcy petition. And in fact, she even filed a motion where she said, I agreed not to be listed on Doug's bankruptcy petition in return for payments. Right. But those payments were never made, as, as if to say conspiracy to commit bankruptcy fraud is voided out if you try it and you're unsuccessful, but you never get rewarded in some way, which of course is not the statute. All you need to show is they agreed and there was at least one overt act, and that act doesn't even have to be an illegal act. Right. It can be anything that showed, like not mentioning it on multiple financial affidavits, five, you know, hiring a lawyer to try and work out the details yep. with Doug, you know, all this stuff. Your findings can be uh, found. I did post it on my website, by mm -hmm. the way. I, uh, I did just see it. And uh, so if anybody's interested in looking for the finding on the, this particular case, uh, petition number 34, just go to kevinavard.com, look under the news type, type and, and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll see your petition under there. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, and I know you're, you're still going through some other things. You've, you've mm -hmm. gone to, uh, did you go to the Executive Council already to, to listen to the hearings? Uh, I've been to a couple of the committee hearings. Um, I'm Just, not aware of it. Well, they're, they're obviously the, Governor Lynch is uh, going to be you know, appointing some judges, and so mm -hmm. it's important that the Executive Council understand that there's, there's right. ongoing issues, not necessarily with the appointees, maybe one or two, but mm -hmm. we want to bring it to their attention. Yeah. So, and I, I've also tried to make recommendations on how the laws could not necessarily be rewritten, but be reorganized mm -hmm. so as to sort of say the same thing, but structured in a way where the judge can't sort of ignore one piece and right. just process the other. So right. I've been trying to help with ideas there. Yeah. Um, because if you, I mean, Are you going to be submitting any le legislation for next, uh, this uh, next term? I mean, I've you're... already provided uh, quite a few thoughts on ways some of these statutes could be reworded right. uh, so that they still provide some of the same protections but give judges less room to, to err. Right. Because we're all human. Well, my time is running out at, at this point, so I want to, again, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for taking the extra time, and I appreciate you going to bat because people need to know that you can still fight. Mm -hmm. You speak up and be heard, and what you're doing right now is going to help somebody else up the road. Yeah. So thank Dan for coming on the show. Uh, is there any final thought? Last well, thought. for anyone trying to uh, set the record straight, just get all your ducks lined up, be thorough. Mm -hmm. If you can organize it and put it on CDs, if it's the, the sort of volume of documents that I have. Right. Um, Whatever you can do <coughs> to help people work their way through it. Because right. the first response is going to be, oh, it's a divorce matter. It's right. just an, a mad dad or whatever. The I know Denise McIntosh, she's been on the uh, show here. She's a, a, an independent paralegal. Not, mm -hmm. yeah, paralegal. She can help with things like that. So look her up. Uh, she's been on the show. So I want to thank you again. I want to sure. thank you people for uh, tuning in and watching the show. I know there's not a whole lot of commercials. This is kind of dry stuff. But it's important that if you're going through this, uh, that you understand that people are, are plowing through this. They're not afraid to speak up and be heard. So, uh, and if you like this show, please sponsor us uh, at 68 Bartimus Trail. Uh, it's, uh, you can just uh, sponsor us through uh, donations or whatever. Uh, help us keep this process going. Uh, again, it's uh, uh, Speak Up Video Productions at 68 Bartimus Trail, Nashua, New Hampshire, 03063. Uh, until next week, thanks again. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up.
to stand up and fight back.